What does it mean to be the church now at COVID-19's one-year anniversary? Can we call it a paniversary? I don't know, maybe that's a little cheeky. Now, uh, I really felt we needed a chance to reflect on the past year, and so this is some reflections that you may not all agree with, and that's okay. This is an invitation to Christ-centered thinking, conversation, action, and living that we may be the church now for the glory of God. It's hard to believe it's one whole year this week that COVID-19 became a felt reality for us. Now, I, I know it's nothing to celebrate. Myriads have lost their lives, and there's barely a place not in some way impacted or isolated in some way. What began in Wuhan, China in 2019 and will make 2020 live in infamy has now imposed itself on 2021 and altered almost every aspect of life, including our lexicons, how we talk. Now we think of bubbles and cohorts much differently than we used to. As a pastor, this year has been the most inspiring and challenging and wearying in my ministry life. And it must be said, this reveals a humbling reality because what I and us together have faced in Canada are really a trifle compared to what has been the past, present, and likely future experience of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe. This is not to dismiss at all what we're exhausted by. I'm exhausted, and I suspect you are too. But to put it all into perspective and also to center my own heart. As, as we approach this anniversary, I am noticing a few things. I'm noticing that the common goodwill that the majority of Canadians, including churches, contributed to is, well, increasingly being replaced by frustration, fear, and discord. Do you remember the 7 p.m. banging of pots and hearts in the windows for frontline workers? There's been a ratcheting up of attempts to get governments to change, change what seems to be inconsistent measures like churches being asked not to open while bars are open. And there's increased polarization that is being shaped by news headlines, the bottomless well of internet searches and rabbit hole algorithm chasing that goes on and our politics and the deep pain and grief that always seeks a way out. How are we to be the church now. I've pondered this deeply. I'm sure you have too. I've been asking the Lord for wisdom. I, I've conversed with other pastors, even globally, and I'm troubled by my own weaknesses and blind spots, to be completely honest. I, I've wrestled with my convictions. And so in what follows, I'm going to reflect on this past year in an attempt to help me and hopefully us together find a deeper place of Christ-likeness and missional awakening. This is most certainly a time to be the church and a most challenging time to discern what that means. So let's begin with what we should learn. First of all, the sovereignty of God. To believe in God is to humble ourselves and submit to his sovereignty over all things, even things we don't understand and are frustrated by. Israel had to learn this both in high and low points. Jesus, God the Son, the head of the church, also rested in this in the toughest times. Our coming into the family of God is always by God's sovereign and gracious will. The sovereign Lord often gets our attention in the deepest valleys that we don't voluntarily choose to enter. That's often been my story. The point is that faith means resting in the sovereign goodness of God and his will, even when we don't understand nor particularly want what he has permitted in the mystery of his ways. A greater kingdom purpose, a greater kingdom purpose, personally, and for the church may be at work. And so listen, we can rest and trust and be content in all circumstances. That's what the scripture says. In all things, God is working toward the ultimate good of Christ's likeness and Christ's witness in his children. That's what the scripture says. 
Resting in the sovereignty of God is the source of giving thanks in all circumstances and the starting point of praise that delights in the majestic beauty of God at work among the nations. That's what the scripture says. Check out Psalm 96. So we should learn again the sovereignty of God as we reflect on this past year. Second, we should learn the biblical nature of the church. Christians must gather. However, the church does not need to gather in the way we have been used to and mass-produced over the last half century to be the faithful church. We have unwittingly equated going to church with being the church, and this has been exposed and is ruining us in a pandemic. I was guest preacher once at a building that had a sign by the entrance that said, this is where our church meets. They got it right. The church is more like the family that lives in a house than the house the family lives in. The church never was a building or an event, or else there would be no New Testament church. The church is, as Jesus first described, ecclesia, those called out from the world, centered on his lordship as a communion of saints to take responsibility for the world and advance God's kingdom against spiritual forces of darkness. The point is, this year has exposed both the strengths of our understanding of the church and their deficiencies. This year was a restoration of peoplehood. This has been church renewal. Have we received the lesson? We need to rejoice again in the biblical nature of the church as the people of God, embodying, proclaiming, and demonstrating the good news so we could be the ecclesia Jesus said we are, wherever we are and whatever moment we find ourselves in. And this will bring new life and purpose to whenever and however we meet together. Third thing I believe we need to learn from this past year is that the Great Commission is the mission. Jesus never commanded his church to start services, have large buildings, or have their political agendas adopted in parliament. He did, with all authority in heaven and on earth, commission his disciples to make disciples of all peoples. In this we are called to love God with all that we are, others as ourselves, and submit everything to his lordship. We are to become more and more like Jesus. And in making disciples, we have Jesus promised that he will be with us always, presumably even in a pandemic. The hard truth is that busy church activities have not always made disciples who are radically committed to Jesus and holiness of life. Willow Creek Church in Illinois offers a warning themselves. Recent American research is chilling in its findings in this regard. The hard truth is that true discipleship has declined. This loss of the church's central mission impacts not only our personal joy and wholeness, but our households, society, and the world. The point is, whatever our response to the pandemic, if a, if a recommitment to character transforming disciple making as the central task of our churches is not renewed, we will have missed the moment and no amount of normalcy is going to help. The church's commission in an always shaky world is to make radical world blessing followers of Jesus. This was God's plan from the beginning. It's still his plan. Another lesson from the past year is we need a just, merciful, humble spirit. The prophet Micah reminded Israel what God had always made known. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That word could not be more relevant today. The last year has revealed a world in turmoil, division, riddled with anger, wounds, fear, and anxiety, even in our churches. God has long shown that to know him means actively pursuing what is right and just in the world, loving, compassion, and merciful living, and a daily, steady walk with God that shapes it all. 
Jesus' actions in healing the wounded, calling out injustice, challenging religious and political pompousness, and ultimately suffering for sin, fulfill the prophetic word and send us to do the same. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The Holy Spirit awakens and empowers the disciples for this kingdom witness. The point is, if this pandemic has brought out anger, self-centeredness, fear, lack of charity, especially toward other believers, disengagement from the problems of our broken time, and a closer walk with your favorite news channel than with God, we have not learned or even rejected what God has shown. Another lesson is how to pray. When Jesus was about to face the full force of the cross, the joint effort of the political and the religious humanity against God's revelation of himself, he battled in prayer. When the first believers suffered their first overt experience of persecution, their response was not protest, but prayer. Prayerful intercession for the sake of the gospel and society is to be the church's first work, even for those who govern in ways we don't like or even persecute us. The church at the end of her rope in this paniversary must learn how to pray like the church historically and globally has needed to. We must recover the power and simplicity of praying Jesus' way. We also need to learn from this past year that we're in a missional moment. Missions has for a long time been understood as something that happens over there. But the church in North America should be hearing the blaring siren call to pay attention to what has been reality for some time already, that Western Christians are no less missionaries here in Canada or the United States as they are in India or Uzbekistan. This past year has been missionary training. If you were in a country where churches could not meet, how would you start influencing society with the sweet aroma of the good news of Jesus? What would be best missionary practice? God has been enrolling us in this new school for a generation, but we've been too slow, too stuck, too much in denial, too sure we were just one revival or one messianic political figure away from recapturing the good old days. Do you know that the largest Anabaptist churches, are, that's our global denominational family, the largest Anabaptist churches in the world are not in North America. They are in Africa. Here, we are living as Christ's ambassadors on ground zero of what Charles Taylor describes as the secular age. We must learn and embrace the missional moment with humility and courage. Churches are always missionary communities, and we're suddenly awakening to the awareness that wider society doesn't see the church as important, relevant, or even trustworthy anymore. This moment requires mutuality, all hands on deck, and the power of the Spirit. This moment is not to be feared. After all, our Lord promised to be with us to the end as we make disciples. The pandemic has forced every Christian ministry to adapt. We have, for example, the opportunity to vision anew our online presence, which makes the gospel accept, uh, accessible to literally the entire planet. Gutenberg's press fast-tracked the reformation of the 16th century, and we are again in a paradigm-shifting Gutenberg moment. Every church is forced to think in some way about how to harness digital communication. We were dabbling there before, but we can't dabble any longer. The point is, each generation of Christians, writes missiologist Vic Weens, must understand and embrace the mission of God and the mission to which it has been called for its time. And our moment has fully arrived. Another lesson from the last year, how to interpret persecution. Are governmental pandemic measures persecution of the church? 
What is the persecution Jesus said that his followers would face? Because from the very beginning, Jesus prepared his disciples to be hated. The New Testament letters consistently spur on believers facing opposition. Now, Open Doors, which is a ministry serving persecuted Christians worldwide, describes persecution as any hostility experienced as a result of one's identification with Christ. Persecution, as the Bible describes it, is overt opposition to Jesus' lordship being proclaimed and demonstrated through the changed lives of the communion of saints. Biblical persecution is suffering for the name of Jesus and the impact of the presence of the injustice, of the justice, compassion, humility, and transforming power that comes from knowing him and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, in our current reality, we should ask this question. We should ask if actions taken against churches by government are specifically because of our identification with Christ? If yes, then we, sh we should rejoice in being identified with Christ and suffering and the suffering church throughout the ages. But if no, then we should be very cautious in our conclusions, the spirit or the attitude that we are partnering with, and especially out of respect for our oppressed brothers and sisters globally. We should be very wary, actually, of the rights trap, I will call it. Because while we have every legal right to defend our rights, and there may be a time when that's absolutely necessary, like how Paul uses his Roman citizenship shrewdly when he's being beaten unjustly in Acts chapter 22, I would argue that biblically this is not such a time. Meekness and humility is the way of the cross. And I can't think of any biblical precedent for Christians taking their government to court to defend their rights. We are to pray for government and speak truth to power, but we do not wield the weapons of the world, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for those weapons ultimately fail and they shroud the truth of the gospel and cause the church to diminish the witness of Christ. The first Christian apologists addressed government, even in the face of persecution in the second, third, and fourth centuries, based on the quality of their character, their good deeds in society, and their consistent witness of Jesus and his ways, not based upon their rights. And so, yes, we have the right to do so, but herein lies the trap. Because if we cling to our rights now, when Christians, rightly or wrongly, are perceived to have argued against others using their rights in other issues, we have lost our moral credibility. We are exposed as convenient hypocrites. And we have put our hope in something other than God who ordains government and even moves pagan rulers for his holy purposes, but not always for our comfort. The weapons of the world backfire. We must choose the way of the cross, trust the Holy Spirit, hope in resurrection. We must be wary of trying to save ourselves or suffering for, our for, for something other than our identification with Jesus. And biblical persecution is a call to patient endurance, Christian unity, and is often the way God refines his church and advances his kingdom. Tertullian in the second century said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so we should not lose sight of what biblical persecution really is while making disciples able to stand in the full armor of God. Where we have the freedom to proclaim and demonstrate Jesus' lordship, we must press on and adapt while, our love, while loving our neighbors for the common good, committed to doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. Now, this preamble, these lessons that I've reflected on from the past year, hopefully provides a foundation for us to ask a second question, which is, what do we need to be now? Well, can I offer this? We need to be patient. 
The Israelites spent generations in slavery, and Moses spent 40 years tending sheep before the people got desperate enough to cry out to the Lord, and he heard and acted. The Psalms are full of waiting upon the Lord. David waited years between his anointing and his kingship. The Jewish exiles waited 70 years in Babylon until restoration came their way. There is 400 years of silence between the prophet Malachi and the birth of Jesus. A key New Testament theme is patience. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Perseverance and endurance are routinely referred to in Scripture. Yes, yes, this last year has been hard and exhausting, but it's been one year. If God is so patient in his ways... Can't we be patient too? If God has always used long suffering to shape and transform people, why are we being so restless? God's mission is unhurried and unstoppable, writes Alan Kreider. Why are we so hurried when God is not? Will our anxiety hasten God's deliberate work in history, our churches, or our lives? These are questions for our wearied souls and our frantic churches. I think we need to be patient. We also need to rejoice in pruning and refining. The Lord is a refiner, said the prophet Malachi. Jesus talks about the need for good ground and the necessity of pruning for greater fruitfulness. An affluent, consumeristic, therapeutic, and sometimes angry and uncharitable Western Christianity needs some refining and pruning. So let's rejoice that this is happening and embrace it as a sign that we are loved because God disciplines those he loves and the promise of greater fruitfulness. Another thing we need to be about right now is the making of disciples. This is the ultimate task given by our Lord. Now is the time for walking with others, learning together the way of Jesus, growing in our obedience to his ways and immersing those God has entrusted us, beginning with our own households in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make every effort to make disciples now. Every Christian should be expending energy here in simple online community, going for a walk, conversations with a neighbor, in show and telling the gospel and what discipleship looks like. The future of our churches post-pandemic will depend on the quality of the disciples we made in the pandemic. And furthermore, now is the time to take responsibility for your own spiritual growth and discipleship. Don't depend on someone else, like the 10th sermon that you've streamed today. Don't depend on anybody else to do it for you. Jesus invites you to follow him. He wants his sheep to hear his voice and obey him and know his joy and his presence. We also need to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Christians serve. Christians love the poor, the marginalized, and their enemies. Christians even suffer for truth and righteousness where necessary. Justice, mercy, and humility is to set God's people apart in every age. And when this humility has been abandoned is when our greatest sins have occurred. Right now, we should be at the front of the line in doing good and bringing peace when the world is drowning in fear and apathy and anger and discord and, yes, onion layers of spiritual, emotional, and physical sickness. It is the sick who need a doctor, said Jesus, and we're his medical corps. Furthermore, we need to stop saying the church is closed. The church is the body of Christ, the ecclesia. And when Jesus stepped out of the tomb, the door opened for good and always. 
the Spirit of God empowered the church for open ministry before the world. The church is never closed. She is always advancing against the gates of hell. Yes, yes, we need to make sure we don't give up meeting together to spur one another on toward love and good deeds, as Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us. But such gathering to encourage others on the journey doesn't need to happen in an auditorium with a few hundred people, as much joy as that is and will be again. The church is open for business now because the church is the people of God, filled with the Spirit, and therefore always able, always able to fulfill the commands of Jesus in word and deed. We need to love the church and contend for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is much that can rip the body of Christ apart now. Let us beware of self-inflicted wounds and friendly fire. The devil is roaring about seeking to destroy. So wherever the Lord has placed us and with whom he has brought us into fellowship, let us contend for unity. We're not always going to agree but we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And so let us model love, long-suffering, charity, truth-telling, forgiveness, and kindness so that we obey Jesus' commission to be and make disciples. Let us speak well of one another, even those who come to different conclusions. So long as Christ is proclaimed and the good deeds of the kingdom bring glory to our Father in heaven. At the end of the day, to be in Christ is to be a part of his body. And so let us love God with all we are and our neighbor as ourselves. Let us love the church. After all, Jesus loves us. Let our love for one another reveal to whom we belong. And there's one more thing we need to do. We need to pray. Let us give ourselves to personal and corporate prayer like never before. Jesus dared to ask us, to, Jesus dared us to ask in his name for greater things. It's time to do this. So as I come to a conclusion here, wait, may, can we declare a few necessary commitments to be the church now? In this moment, un unprecedented in most of our lifetimes, we humbly confess our impatience and spiritual immaturity. We want to grow into maturity and ask the Lord to help us, which we believe he has a plan for. Can we make a commitment to make disciples? that we take personal responsibility to grow as disciples and form a church life around disciple-making with focused attentiveness. We will meet to spur one another on in the direction of disciple-making in whatever ways we can. We will call other generations to follow us, follow Jesus with us, not, not segregating ourselves into our generational enclaves or only with those who agree with us. We will go to our world, not retreat. We will invite people to follow Jesus with us, recognizing that though we are doing, what we're doing seems small, it may be like a mustard seed growing to great heights or yeast making mouth-watering homemade delights. We will disciple the righteous to flourish for God's shalom and peace to abound through people of all ages and cultures Wherever we have influence, we will disciple to see godly character be the aroma of Christ in the world right now. Can we make a commitment to patiently endure? It's not time for hurriedness, but perseverance. Let us live lives of worship, adapting where necessary to make disciples. We will not fear, for he is with us to the very end and his spirit is at work even when we can't see it. Let us also contend for unity among God's people 
recognizing our need for a diversity of gifts and callings and congregations to be a thriving, patiently enduring church. Can we also make a commitment to serve the common good and be shalom-centered? We join with the world in our context, just as, by the way, Jesus accepted certain limitations in his own day beneath the rule of Rome. We don't like, but we accept restrictions for the common well-being, but also accept the responsibility to go above and beyond in serving our neighbors, in speaking for those who can't, in seeking the shalom, the wholeness and well-being of the small spheres of responsibility and opportunity that God has assigned to us. We know that we will be judged for what we did to the least of these. We will seek in our age to live what Cyprian called the third century church to. We do not speak great things, but we live them. And may we be shrewd and innocent and trust the Holy Spirit. We should not and will not be silent should authorities demand that we cease serving or speaking in the name of Jesus. We will trust the Holy Spirit to give us discernment and courage should such a time come when we must say we must obey God rather than human beings as the first century church did in Acts chapter 5. We have to remember, for instance, what Christians in Nazi Germany called the church to focus on through the Barman Declaration. You can search it out. We will focus on Jesus' lordship, doing rightly, justly, and walking humbly with God and not be distracted by that which will pass. And finally, can we make a commitment to pray? Perhaps we need to pray for forgiveness where we've sinned, compassion for the suffering, boldness to proclaim the good news, wisdom for those entrusted to lead, for our other church fellowships, and for the kingdom to come on earth just as it is in heaven. And we will talk, and we make a commitment to talk with one another. Discerning faithfulness to Christ takes conversation, multiple gifts, mutual submission, thinking the best of others, not the worst, and courage to trust what Jesus is up to in the world. We must always see ourselves as another expression of that unlikely first band of disciples who were learning what it meant to be in their day the community where Jesus Christ is Lord. And then, having prayed and talked, let us pray some more. And so, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.